I'll make those analogies in that program, but with Artie, he figures, hey, I've been thrown out of a raft, I'm gonna tie myself inside. And I thought that's a good decision, but he thinks it through and goes, wait a minute, what if a raft just does a 180? Then I'm gonna be upside down, tied in my life raft, incoming water, I'm gonna drown in my own raft. So he does not tie himself in. And what happens two hours later? Does a 180, at least he's not tied in, he's able to swim out. And he comes up with a lot of creative things through this ordeal, right? I only touch on a few, but in this case, he's hanging on to the outside of the life raft, doesn't think he can do it for long. He sees one of the ripped ballast bags, he actually crawls into it, gets in the fetal position in the bag, and hangs on for dear life. So he's curled up in a ball, hugging the bag around, because the last thing he needs to do is lose his life after it's all over. And so he keeps coming up with new techniques to keep going a little longer. And every now and then the thought about giving up comes, because it's an attractive option to get out of the pain. As soon as you think give up, it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, so he would just try to put it out of his head and focus on what do I got to do to stay alive? And I've interviewed dozens of survivors and the good ones, that's how they get through the ordeal. So for all of us when we're faced with adversity, just break the big overwhelming thing down to our chunks. What do I got to do in the next hour to make this better? And that's what Ernie was doing. He was even talking to himself. Like, so how would you talk to yourself? He was giving himself pep talks. So I finally found a picture of what a 90-foot wave looked like. And this came from a later book of mine called A Storm Too Soon. It came out last year. And it's hard for you to see how big this wave is because there's no man-made objects in it. But if you look closely, there is a life raft with three men in it, two men, which is mislabeled, by the way. But this gave me a full appreciation for what Ernie was going through. Because in Ernie's case, you know, you can see the top of the wave is breaking. When it would break and fall down on him, it would just crush his back and then tumble the raft. And so it wasn't until I actually saw this slide that I had a full appreciation for what Ernie's going through all alone. And being alone is so much tougher than going through this with a couple other people. In a storm too soon, there's three men in this raft, and the story's about what happens to them, whereas in Ernie's case, he's alone. Now, he's made it 24 hours, and it's now into Sunday. The worst part is the sleep deprivation. That's almost as bad as the hypothermia. Because he didn't sleep Friday night, the storm was building. Of course, Saturday night he's in the raft. And now it's Sunday, he's gone all this time with no sleep. And the raft is falling apart. It's leaking, the ballast bags are gone, uh, there's tears in it. And uh, he realizes, we're we were too far out for a helicopter's fuel to come, even if they know we're out here. And even though he knows they never got a mayday off. He said, even if they do search for me, we're too far out. Turned out he was right. They were too far out for a helicopter. And the, the raft that he's in, this was the, at the time it was, this company's now out of business, but at the time this was, uh, somewhat of an invention, these ballast bags to make it stable. But the waves are so big, it ripped them. But that's what Ernie crawled into when the raft was upside down, the torn bag. <laughs> I had to ask about sharks. And what Ernie did was put sharks right out of his mind because he had no control over that, whereas he did have control with some things to do with the raft, how to stay in it, how to get back in it, how to look over the couple emergency supplies. There were a couple emergency supplies inside water, but it was in a can, and there was no can on there, so you can imagine. <laughs> uh, but he, he decided, I'm not going to worry about sharks because I have no control. And there's some other great techniques. You don't have control over it, just let it go. There's too many 
debate would do it. We were worried about the wrong stuff. So now we're into Sunday. He's been in and out of the water for 48 hours. He's near <coughs> death. And Peter Brown has told the Coast Guard, hey, there was another vessel out there nobody's heard from called the Fair Wind. And the Coast Guard says, okay, we're going to launch search planes. And this P-3 comes down from Canada. They're doing grids way out there. And lo and behold, on Sunday morning, they see this lone light ray. So they, in turn, tell the Coast Guard cutter the, the coordinates. And it was this cutter, and it was actually really fortuitous, but I found a gentleman who was on this cutter who lived in the Portsmouth, New Hampshire area. And I said, do you remember that day? He said, not only do I remember it, he said, I took pictures. And so the next couple of pictures he took as they're looking for Ernie. And he said, there's Ernie's little raft way out there. And then we lowered our launch to go and get the light raft. And so I said, who was in the launch? And he gave me a name. And this coastie was from Cape Cod. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but I, I said to him, what's going through your mind as you're going to that raft? And he said, well, all of us on the cutter had been talking that you know, these people were long since dead from hypothermia. It's Thanksgiving, it's freezing, we're cold, and we're inside the cutter. So he said, when we pulled up next to the raft, he said, I expected there to be four dead bodies inside, because we knew there were four people on that vessel. He said, so I put my hand to steady the raft, and I'm in the boat. And he said, I almost had a heart attack. He said, the little doorway opened. And there's this guy with a big black beard, and his skin was purple. He was alive. And uh, this skipper said, I almost fell right out of the boat. I never expected anybody to be alive inside. He said, so we bundled him up, so that's Ernie in the blankets. And they brought him back. The Coast Guard guys were in survival suits. Too bad Ernie wasn't. But, um, when I told Ernie, I said, hey, I found pictures of you coming back to the ship. Do you want to see him? He waited like a, two weeks thinking about it. He wasn't so sure he even wanted to remember seeing those pictures. But eventually, he said yes. So they bring him on board, and they say, could anybody else be alive? And he shook his head, and he grilled him. How do you know that? And Ernie said, I saw the ship go down. And then uh, they give him some soup, put him in dry clothes, and all the poor guy wants to do is sleep. But after 15 minutes, they wake him up, and they say, your vital signs are bad. We don't have the medical facilities. We're steaming in to get close to the land. The helicopter's going to come out. They're going to take you to a hospital. And so when the helicopter comes, the pilot says, it's still too lumpy for me to land. They're pulling Ernie out of the get here. I'm amazed, look at Ernie, he, he can put one hand up. I'm amazed he could even move. He's so far off the charts in terms of survivability uh, that the Coast Guard would have long since been given up on the search. That every now and then there's one of these survivors that just somehow, maybe through mental willpower, beats the physical odds. But they need to put him in a basket to get him up in the helicopter, and he's like, no, 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 and trying to fight him off. And I'm like, Ernie, what's the big deal after everything you've been through? And he goes to me, try it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his point is, you're in a little basket, and the cable's about as big as my pinky, and now you're above the very ocean that you tried to get out of that's so cold, he's going to be dangling up there. And then later, as I got to know him, he whispers, and I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> <laughs> so he did not want to go. And they brought him out on the deck, and they put a life jacket on him, and he's screaming, now you're putting a life jacket on me. <laughs> he goes, I want to stay on the ship. And they're like, no, you have to go. Then what they were worried about is he's so hypothermic that as he begins to warm, the blood from his frozen hands and feet is going to come towards his heart. And they want to have him in the hospital in case he goes into the shock or hypothermic heart attack. And 
behind it. Down comes the basket. I was able to find a paramedic who was on board. She was living in the Nantucket, so she fills in, you know, this part of the book. It's amazing after all the years through search engines on the internet, you can find these key people who were there. And this is him landing, and they're taking his, his body out of the aircraft, and they've gone all the way to a hospital in Beverly, Massachusetts. And by now, the story is three days old, so the story's in the news. And a week later, the people of the loved ones who died realized, hey, the weather buoy wasn't even working, uh, and the weather service said everything's going to be fine. So they launched a lawsuit against the National Weather Service. Now, nobody's ever successfully sued the National Weather Service, but they win. And it's a long, drawn-out case. It's absolutely a fascinating case. I put a little of it in the back of Fatal Forecast uh, because the judge is just tearing into the National Weather Service going, what do you mean you gave the report and not tell these mariners that the buoy had been hit by a ship and was giving all sorts of screwy data. And the weather forecast, you, you know, I read the whole thing at the National Archives, it's cover to cover. In the beginning, the weather forecast guys in early testimony are saying, oh, yes, that buoy's critical for our report. Then later, their management got, must have got to them. They're in court, and they're like, oh, no, we don't really use the buoys that much. You know, you can see their whole story change. But, the government is not going to open Pandora's box, so they take it all the way to the Supreme Court, and the decision is overturned, and nobody gets a dime. And I'm often asked, so that was all these years ago, you know, 30 years ago, what happened to these men? Well, here's Brad on the left. Uh, Brad is a fisherman for many years, lives in New Hampshire. Peter Brown in the middle. Peter Brown's still fishing out of George's Bank in a much bigger, bigger boat. And then uh, Sarge, and he's doing inshore lobstering. And then people say, well, what about Ernie Hazard? Well, at first, he didn't go back to fishing. He said, I wanted a job where there were trees and birds. <laughs> and I don't blame him. I said, so what do you do? And he said, I got a job at a graveyard. <laughs> well, that's a weird thing. And he said, hey, it's quiet. <laughs> and uh, no ocean, but he said, I eventually did go back to fishing and relocated out in California. But one day he asked, you know, what about the guy whose position I took? What's he doing now? They said, didn't you know he got taken overboard with the net? And that's when Ernie said, I'm done. You know, it just kind of hit him and used up his nine lives. And so he's doing just fine out in California, still got the big beard, and that's one of those giant lobster claws that came up in the trap from George's Bay. And in the back of the, the book, I said to the people who helped me, I said, here's your chance to say whatever you want in the epilogue. No editing from me, you say whatever you want. Ernie just had this really simple epilogue. He just said something like, these are three years I'm living so I don't let the little stuff get to me. He said, I wake up and I just give thanks for each and every day and I don't look beyond the day. And I thought, what a beautiful fly. We could only all of us just do what he practices now. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. I'll uh, take questions or comments you might have. Ernie was great to work with. He could not have found a better partner. But he, he said to me, had you called me closer to the accident, I would have spoken. He said, it, it took me years to be able to talk about this. And that's, that's what I found with some survivors. Some want to talk, it's therapy, others not so much. Yes, sir. This brought back to the memory of that when I was a board of destroyer. Uh -huh. And uh, we were across the Atlantic to go to the invasion of North Africa. Where you could see nothing but ships. But beside us was a 
half the truth battle can have the truth. You know, I'm on a little destroy it. <laughs> the twelve were so deep that you couldn't see the battleship. And uh, when you hit some of them, there's quite yeah. a few of the sailors that were retired to my head. And they got thrown out of their bunks and everybody else. Yeah, Ernie told me in his bunk yeah. he had a seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you, you know, take it from a car. Thank you. Yes? Did you actually go on out to shore to find one of the boats, or did you just Good question. She said, did I actually go out to Georgia's bank? Well, Peter invited me, and I said, oh, no, I'll just be in the way. And he said, you don't have to do any more. And I said, oh, I think i got to pay on the obligation that day. I did not want to go that far. I'm always on the ocean, but I'm usually 10 miles. I'm not 300. So, no, I did not go. Yeah. Now that you've got a movie coming, yeah. how much control of it that you have? Not Any? much. I, I have had some input into the screenplay, but once you sign over the rights, you you lose control. But what I have seen of the screenplay is pretty accurate. The movie is the book, The Finest Hours, and so far they are staying true to the story. What did you think of the Frederick Strong? Oh, I thought it was a great movie and a good, good book. Uh, yeah. And in Perfect Story, they talk about Bob Brown. And he was pretty accurate in his Sebastian Younger's assessment. But I'll take more questions at the back table, and I'll be happy to, to sign books for gifts. And Matt, thank you so much for uh, the help and organizing it into the Historical Society. And hope to be back soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a nice turn. Not the film Thank you. Oh, it's fun to redo. I haven't done this in a while. Oh, good. So that's the disaster tape.